I am Carrie Sheffield. I'm a senior policy analyst with the Independent Women's Forum. I was a Robert Novak Journalism Fellow and completed the European Journalism Institute program through TFAS in 2006. And you are listening to the Liberty and Leadership Podcast. Hello and welcome. I'm Roger Ream, and this is the Liberty and Leadership Podcast, a conversation with TFAS alumni who are making a real impact in politics, public policy, government, business, philanthropy, law, and the media. Today, we have an amazing guest joining me, Illinois Senate Republican leader and TFAS alumnus, Dan McConkie. Dan has represented Illinois' 26th district since 2016, and prior to his leadership position, Dan served as a caucus budget negotiator, advocating for responsible state spending and lower taxes. Boy, that must be a thankless job in Illinois, Dan. Dan has staunchly supported policies and legislation that promote job growth and a smaller, smarter government, and currently serves on the Senate Executive and Redistricting Committees. Dan has quite an interesting background. He joined the Army National Guard on his 17th birthday, has a bachelor's degree in biblical studies from Central Bible College, graduated magna cum laude with a master's degree in Christian thought and an emphasis on bioethics from Trinity International Divinity School. He spent two years as an adjunct professor at Trinity International University, teaching graduate level bioethics and public policy. I've had the pleasure of knowing Dan McConkie for over 30 years, and I'm excited to discuss with him some of the lessons of liberty and leadership he has learned over the years. Dan, thank you for joining me, and welcome to the show. Great to be on with you, Roger. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, Dan, you you often tell the story of how you found a brochure when you were in college, and you almost threw it away. Could you remind me of that story today? I was on uh, the student newspaper as the news editor and uh, came into the office one day. We had a a series of mail slots that, uh, you know, know, the mail would come in and get, you know, the features editor, news editor, and so forth. And I pulled the mail out and uh, the Fund for American Studies had sent an invitation to apply uh, for the degree, you know, the uh, programs in Washington, D.C., and I, I looked at it and I was like, wow, this, this really looks amazing. I had not been to Washington since I was on a middle school trip, uh, you know, a middle school choir trip, actually. We went and sang outside the uh, Washington Monument I, you know, in, in some big thing. But uh, beyond that, you know, I had, hadn't had any real opportunity to be there and had an interest in politics, uh, generally speaking. Um, I had actually taken a group of students from my college to a rally for George H.W. Bush back in 1992 uh, on a school bus all the way from Springville, Missouri to St. Louis. And so I I was interested in it, opportunity to go to Washington, you know, uh, 10 classes at the time, which were at Georgetown, and do an internship. And I turned it over and I looked at the back and I saw the price, which was about $2,500. And for me, I was paying for college entirely on my own, largely through student loans. I knew that that was something I couldn't afford. And I was standing over the trash can and I went to throw it away. And just as it kind of got right right about to, to let it go at the bottom, it said, you know, scholarships available. And I thought, well, you know, it doesn't hurt to apply. So I applied and got a scholarship and went uh, to the Institute on Political Journalism, 1993, and uh, just had a fantastic experience there. It really did change my life and orientation in a way that uh, I'm not sure anything else quite has. Then now, today, you and your wife are funding scholarships for students to come to our program. So you're, you're, you're giving back very generously, and we appreciate that. Absolutely. Now, you uh, went uh, a few years later to a program we organize still in the Czech Republic in Prague. And uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about what that experience was like, because when you went, you know, those students had just a few years earlier come out from under communism. So it must have been a fascinating experience. No, absolutely. You know, uh, it, we, I had not been to Europe before and uh, had the opportunity of going. And so I, I, I went and, you know, there was, there was about, I think, <clears throat> about 109 of us, uh, 
108, 109, 110, something like that. Nine of us were Americans, but the rest were from every country from the former Soviet bloc, including, uh, it, it, you know, the Soviet, you know, Russia itself. Uh, you know, I, I remember one night being at a pub and, and I'm at a table and there was uh, a Rus two Russians, a Georgian, a Serbian, uh, and then, you know, two of us Americans. And we were talking about basketball, you know, so it was just uh, <clears throat> a fantastic experience. One of the more interesting things that I had never thought of before having gone there uh, was, you know, just how ubiquitous the English language is worldwide, but still, you know, was amongst the former communist bloc. And I remember us going around and me and one of the other Americans uh, were, were kind of commenting that it was sort of unfair that, you know, we only knew English in between us. And if we talked, everyone could understand what we said, but the Romanians and you know, the others, they could drop into their own native tongue and talk about us. So we had no idea what it was uh, that they were saying. But yeah, the uh, the stories of, of these kids who had uh, grown up under communism, many of them uh, without a lot of opportunity, having just dreamed of freedom or the ability to travel, but uh, not never sure that that was ever going to come, uh, was was an amazing thing to experience firsthand. Yeah, I, I went over there uh first in 1992 when we were looking to start a program and it was just an interesting time because there was such a thirst among young people to learn about the United States, uh, to do American studies, uh, to come study in the U S uh, and it's different today. Of course, we still do the program and I think it's a powerful program today, but the students today are, uh, you know, don't have that direct experience with communism. And so they, they come with a different mindset. But uh, I, I think you and I were blessed to be over there so soon after the Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union collapsed uh, and be with students who really enabled us to really appreciate what we had and how blessed we were to grow up in America. Well, to hear stories, uh, uh, you know, I had, there was one student who told me the story about how she, her parents, she remembered how her parents they would tell political jokes at the table in their own house, but they would always whisper when they did it, uh, just out of reflex. And, you know, that is something that so many of us don't know or understand today, uh, don't have that kind of experience. And so that's something that, uh, you know, is often lost and sometimes is lost between, even between uh, siblings in the same household. Uh, so uh, I, I've even observed that as well, in which you have, you know, a few years apart and you'll have someone who, who grew up, uh, became a teenager under communism and a younger sibling who was, you know, just in elementary school and their outlook on the world and, and kind of understanding of the impacts of totalitarianism and, and the negative impacts, I should say, are, can be completely different. Yeah, I'll, I'll just mention as an aside, this year we have four uh, or f four or five students coming to our program in Prague from Ukraine, and uh, that'll be something. We, we, uh -huh. I got an email from one a few weeks ago saying, I've submitted my application, but I'm having trouble getting my professor to write a letter of recommendation. I'm currently in a bomb shelter in Kharkiv. Could you accept my, in, my application without the recommendation letter? I said, I got back to her and said, you, you're, you're accepted and you have a full scholarship. So yeah, uh, our do our donors have been generous in, in contributing to a Ukrainian scholarship fund this year. So that's why we are, you know, accepting any Ukrainian who, uh, who applies now, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't you meet your wife at our program in Prague? I did. Uh, I mentioned having been in a pub with, uh, several different people from different nationalities. And it was actually on that night sitting at that table in which at one point I looked up and it, so we were in a, a dormitory that's kind of in a suburb of Prague. You know, Prague's a very old city, uh, very compact downtown. And, you know, at Charles University, where the institute uh, is held, uh, didn't have housing or anything associated with it, didn't have a, a large footprint there. So students would have to travel uh, in from kind of a suburban area. They would get onto the train and, and go in. So we stayed in one of these dormitories and they had a neighborhood pub there and I'm not sure the folks in the neighborhood actually appreciated like all these different kids from <laughs> coming into their pub. Right. But yeah, uh, we did that and, you know, we're sitting in the corner and 
uh, each, all of us having beers, which it was great at the time, you know, in the mid nineties, beer was a quarter uh, for, you know, half a liter and uh, which was amazing for us, right? It, you know, we were used to spending $5 in, in America for a beer, but it, it, the door opened to this pub and in walked about a dozen girls from the program from Bulgaria and Romania. And they all came and ended up sitting next to us and we ended up in having extensive discussions and, and I, you know, some of, we ended up moving around some. And at one point I ended up sitting next to a young lady from Bulgaria and I'm, I'm somebody who's very aware of my surroundings and kind of what's going on around me. But at one point we looked up and everyone at their table was gone. They had gotten up and paid their bill and left and kind of left us there. And so, uh, you know, I, kind of took charge of the situation to walk her back uh, to the dormitory afterward. And, you know, we kept it, you know, hung out over those three weeks in Prague and then uh, parted as friends. But, you know, one thing led to another. And a year later, we actually got married and uh, still married 25, 26, almost 26 years now uh, later. Uh, two girls. And uh, yeah, it's been an f- amazing experience not just knowing somebody, but, you know, being married to someone who grew up in that kind of environment. I mentioned, you know, the the difference that can exist between even kids in the same family and their understanding of having grown up under socialism. And I've seen that, like, within my wife, you know, between my wife and her younger sister. Younger sister's about six and a half years younger. And as a result, you know, the younger sister uh, ha- is open to, like, considering uh, some ideology, ideological kind of perspectives that my wife thoroughly repudiates because of her experience with them as a teenager, uh, that my, uh, you know, sister-in-law did not experience in the same way. So I've, I've had an up close, uh, you know, front seat in being able to observe that phenomenon. Yeah. Well, I, uh, your story reminds me of another couple that, uh, met at our program and have been married for many years. Uh, both Americans in this case, but uh, he likes to refer to our program as the world's most expensive dating service. But uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's more uh, expensive ones out there. Uh, yeah, there are. We, but we've had quite a few of those <laughs> kinds of connections made at our program that have, have led to lasting marriages. So mm-hmm. we don't object to that. Now, uh, you uh, joined the Army National Guard on your 17th birthday, I think, and, and served for yeah. nine years in the infantry and the military police. Uh, what factored in your decision to enlist? And thank you, thank you also for your service, Dan. Oh, I appreciate that. I, mm-hmm. I grew up, so I grew up in a very rural part of Indiana. My mom uh, grew up amongst uh, cornfields. Uh, she, they, my dad, my father, my grandfather, I should say, was not a farmer. Uh, he actually worked at an area manufacturing plant, a Pfizer plant. Uh, but they grew up, and their house was a quarter mile off the road. Uh, down a lane and, you know, uh, with cornfields all the way around. My dad grew up on the Illinois side of the border, and uh, he, he actually grew up in a farming family. He, it was very typical for him to get up at 5 a.m. Uh, during planting season, go uh, plant until it was time to get on the school bus, take the school bus to school, stay for football practice, come back, and go back into the field. So hard work was something that we were always, uh, me and my brothers were always impressed upon us to do. But then also, you know, the opportunity of being able to give back and, uh, you know, participate. So uh, my grandfather, uh, who was who worked at that factory, had actually served in World War Two. He was he was relatively late. I think he was 34 years old when the war started and and America got involved. And uh, so he married my grandmother and two weeks later shipped off to Italy uh, for four years and then came back and was introduced for the first time to my aunt. (laughs) whom he had never met, uh, you know, who was born while he's away. So, you know, this, that service, giving back, hard work, and, you know, being committed in a sacrificial manner is something that my family has always, uh, always had. Now, Dan, you uh, eventually uh, finished school and work, have worked in public policy and national advocacy organizations, uh, served as vice president of Americans United for Life, what, what drew you to that organization? I know you, you had an academic background in ethics and bioethics, but uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I was always interested uh, ever since the program. Really, when, I, when I was in the uh, Institute on Political Journalism uh, there in Washington, D.C. for those six weeks, 
uh, I got to do some really interesting advocacy work. I did an internship with a, an advocacy group, uh, and we, you know, I, I got to go onto Capitol Hill and participate in hearings and uh, go go into government agencies and force uh, diplomat or the uh, employees there to print off several hundred pages of their grants that they had done, and then we would take back and comb through them for questionable ways of, you know, federal spending, and then, you know, give that information over to legislators at the time. You know, this was right before Republicans took over the House in 1994. So uh, I remember, you know, go, visiting with Dick Armey and, you know, giving him that material. And so, you know, I, I was always interested in that and, and being involved in an organization that defended the sanctity of human life from the beginning to the very end was something that I was very uh, interested in. And, you know, the emphasis of that organization was to focus on the work that was done at the state level. Uh, and, you know, while there is a great deal of attention that is given for natural reasons to Congress and to what's going on in Washington, D.C., you know, the vast majority of laws that govern our everyday lives are done at the state and local level. And it's something that can easily be overlooked by people, and you can make a, a, a great difference. And the organization that I worked in did work all across the country. And one of the really interesting experiences about that is if I had a bad day in New Jersey, I could have a, the next day I could have a good day in Missouri and a, and a great day the day after that in Oklahoma. So you just, you always had the opportunity of making a difference uh, because of all these different laboratories of democracy that exist across the country. Yeah, and that that's hitting on a point right now that's very timely because with this pending Supreme Court decision, that is likely to be an uh, issue that will be moved back to the states, and that's where the battlegrounds will be on, on that particular issue. But could you talk a little bit about the event in 2007 that dramatically changed your life uh, on a you know sunny day when you went off uh, for you know, what you expected to be just an enjoyable ride on your motorcycle and were the victim of a hit and run. Yeah, so I was going over to help a friend move. It was on a Friday. I had taken the day off and uh, it was a gorgeous June day and I uh, got on my bike. I, I actually thought, you know, maybe I should take the car and, you know, be able to put some stuff in it. And I thought, oh, no, he's got a moving truck. I'll just, it's beautiful. I'll take the bike. And I took the bike and I was driving through an intersection about... 10 minutes from my house and a car turned on a red light, came straight into my lane and pushed me and my motorcycle uh, into oncoming traffic. And I actually don't remember the accident at all, uh, but I did wake up two weeks later to find out a spinal cord injury, no feeling or function left in my legs. Uh, so that required about, you know, a year of healing and therapy, uh, physical therapy in order to be able to kind of function again. Uh, a lot of modifications to the house. I'm, you know, uh, in a wheelchair uh, permanently. And that is, you know, it made, makes life really interesting, right? You know, living in a uh, place like sh uh, Chicago and, and the area here, despite the fact that we've had the ADA since 1990, uh, you know, there's still places and, and things that are not accessible to me. And one of the most interesting things being a, an elected official and running for office is a, a lot of what you're supposed to do is not only go out to meet people, but go door to door. But I would say 99.5% of the doors in my district, I cannot reach the front door. There's some form of step or obstacle in order to get up. So for in order for me to be able to uh, go out and, and meet voters where they live, I have to have help to go and do that. So, you know, there's a series of challenges that uh, exists. But, you know, one of the things that I ha learned when I was in the infantry was this motto, adapt and overcome. Uh, that, that was something because when you when you go into a firefight, the first thing that happens, you know, when the bullets start to fly, you go in with a plan, but the bullets start to fly and your plans immediately force you to have to change and adjust. And so your responsibility is to kind of adapt to the to the situation that's thrown at you and still work to overcome and, and obtain the obstacle that you've been assigned to take. And so that is, uh, you know, something that I've just made a life motto and something that I've done uh, in this case here. Yeah, is that, that's a, a great motto, a great way to live, and you, it was forced on you in some sense, but how, how do you apply that in your role as a legislator, uh, this adapt and overcome? Yeah, so there, uh, it's, it's rare that a piece of legislation that you introduce 
Uh, well, one, it's somewhat rare that it becomes law, but then when, even when it does become law, it is rare that it becomes law either in its ideal form or in the manner in which you desire, right? Uh, it, it, I can just think of even this year. So, you know, dirt, we had uh, the COVID pandemic uh, was obviously a serious situation that we had. And one of the things that upset many people was the fact that our governor here uh, not only shut down uh, businesses and pick between winners and losers, but would prevent people from being able to go in and visit their loved ones in long-term care or in hospitals and these type of situations. And yeah. we had countless people die alone, right? And I had a constituent who, who did die alone, uh, a man around 90 years of age who spent 18 days in a hospital. And, and this was earlier this year. I mean, this is a year and a half into the pandemic. Wow. And, um, spent 18 days in the hospital. During that time, he was allowed one visitor for 10 minutes and he died alone. And Terrible. it was uh, such a tragic event and the family, you know, wanted. And so we worked very hard to come up with a, a bill. It was a compromise. We introduced this bill. We get it through the Senate without any problem, gets over to the House and suddenly we had uh, one special interest come out. Uh, we've got to have changes to this. Otherwise, it's we're going to oppose the bill. And it, it was going to become a problem, right? And then we, we make a change. And then another, we had actually the administration come out wanting another change. That, that, and, and this is a bill that would, would make sure that this never happens again. And so he had to make these kind of tweaks and some compromises that I'm not sure were either necessary or, or, or uh, needed. But at the end of the day, adapt to the situation. And well, we were able to get the bill across the finish line now is sitting on the governor's desk and we'll see what he does with it. Yeah. Well, that's a great example of adapting, which is a regular thing you have to do in politics. Talk, if you would, uh, a little bit about your faith uh, and, you know, how that might play a role in your work as a state senator and a Republican leader, if at all. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a Christian. I grew up within that uh, faith community um, it, I have met people from many, many different backgrounds, Jewish, Muslim, uh, other brands of Christianity. Uh, I, I have some Buddhist, you know, and so forth, uh, as, as well as people who have no kind of faith at all. One of the things I would say about having a faith commitment is that it reminds you that the world is not all about you, right? It's, it's very easy. You know, if you think about it, uh, you know, when you're a small, you know, when you, you know, you had, you had kids, many of your viewers have had children or maybe have had, uh, siblings or family, you know, and dealing with infants for that child, the world is all about them. Right. And it's, as they grow up, they learn, um, that, you know, there's other people that, that are important and other perspectives are important. And I think that there's nothing better than, uh, to, having a faith perspective to remember, you know, that there is something beyond us, that it's not all about, you know, uh, human beings that helps to keep you grounded in what it is that you're pursuing uh, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, issues and so forth that you're advancing. And I think that that is really helpful to um, making sure that the kind of ideas and legislation that you're putting forward at the end of the day is really about the people and, uh, and, and, and about their best, their, what's in the best interest of them. And I think having a faith commitment of some sort really does assist in maintaining the right perspective. Now, Dan, uh, we're a nonpartisan organization, of course, uh, educational in our mission, but I am curious as a Republican leader, in Illinois, do you have a strategy or do you see a light that leads you toward someday seeing the land of Lincoln uh, have a majority of Republicans in the legislature or Republicans be able to make more of an impact on policy there? Because we all know Rep Illinois' reputation of you know, corrupt politics. You've had a number of your recent governors end up in prison. Uh, Illinois is suffering uh, from terrible crime and other, uh, you know, problems in the school systems and all. Uh, you've probably got a whole list of policy proposals that could address those things. But, you know, it's difficult when you're a minority party that doesn't, I don't think you even have a ability to override a veto. So what, what is the strategy or how, what, what, what are your, your prospects for the future? Sure. Well, one of the things that I tell kind of anybody who wants to have good government 
uh, in place, you, you've got to have good people involved in that. And uh, as, as you mentioned, we have a history of corrupt politics. Uh, we have governors, four of our last eight governors have been in, seen in orange jumpsuits, and uh, that's, they've been from both parties. The, one, of, one of the things that I would say, though, is that democracy works best when you have active participation, good people in government, but then active participation of people in both parties. And when you have uh, the longstanding majorities that, that the Democrats have had here in the state, it, it leads to an imbalance where you end up with people who don't have, they aren't subject to you know, gerrymandering of districts and redistricting, things like that, who don't, aren't really, don't feel subject to you know, the voters. And when you have that, you end up with uh, corruption. And, and I'll refer to that as either both illegal as well as legal corruption. Like there is certain forms of legal corruption that exist that, you know, where people are just simply acting in their own best interest to get themselves reelected. And it may be contrary to the desires of, of, of the uh, majority of people in the state. Uh, it, and so that is why I think it is... Um, it's important that that we make gains in order to kind of get within shot. And yeah, I, I'm I'm very hopeful that one day we'll have a majority of Republicans here in Illinois, and I do believe that that is possible to obtain. I'm also interested in in what I would refer to as a functional policy majority, and what that is is when you have uh, you know Republicans but able to team up. You we have there's enough of us and enough moderate Democrats who are willing to buck the um, kind of like extremism within their own party uh, and vice versa. You can have extremism even within the Republican Party, but you are able to create those kind of functional majorities that help put uh, good legislation through even when the extremes from one side or the other uh, don't want to support that. Well, I'm tempted to ask you if there was a particular thinker or individual who's had a strong influence on you in your life or a book you've read. But I, I might phrase it differently and just say, if you had the op a choice to have dinner with any one person, living or dead, uh, and to pick their brain and uh, learn from them over dinner, who, who would you select, you think? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, so I think uh, probably the the one person I would pick actually is living, which is Newt Gingrich. Um, Newt Gingrich, you know, a lot a lot of people don't know his uh, background. You know, he first ran for Congress in 1974. He lost, ran again in 76. He lost, finally won in 1978. And then when Ronald Reagan won, and there was uh, Republicans won a majority in the Senate in 1980, he really began to have a dream of having Republicans have a majority in the House which had not happened since 1954. And he began to work to, to secure that goal. And he really worked from the 1982 cycle for the next 12 years until he was finally able to make it a reality in 1994. And, it, you know, and, and at that point, when he was able to finally take the majority, it was you know, Republicans have been in the minority for 40 years. I, I have a book here on my shelf here that is from a, that was written and released early in 1994, and the title is uh, Congress's Permanent Minority, question mark. I mean, even in the same year that Newt Gingrich took back the majority in 1994, there were still political prognosticators who thought that maybe Republicans could never, you know, come back. But that is really the advantage of the two-party system, is the fact of you end up where the two parties adjust to the middle, right? As the middle moves in a country, those two parties adjust to grab their issues. We saw it in 1992, right? In which you had Ross Perot, right? Run, get 17 or 19 percent of the vote uh, between um, Bill Clinton and George H.W. Bush. And within one cycle, all of the issues that Ross Perot had run on were you know, taken up by those other parties, right? Because they recognize, oh, we're missing some important things here. And I think Newt Gingrich was uh, has been key. Plus, he's so intelligent. I, I remember I have a friend who uh, was on his staff, and he said, we would always cringe whenever Newt spoke. We would stand in the back of the room because Newt's brain worked so fast that he would get up there, 
and he would always speak without notes and he would come up with new ideas and right there in front of 500 people he would say so next we're going to do and he would announce and he, the staff would be like we'd have to take notes and be like oh like we're gonna this, you know suddenly we have to go do these new things but he was so brilliant at at that kind of strategy which i think is uh you know vitally important and in in maintaining you know in in the contract with america they helped to really kind of cement the republican party as the party of ideas and what those ideas were i think as uh in in the current era we've moved somewhat away from the concept of the Republican Party being about ideas and maybe more about personality. And I think that we need to kind of regain that again. I can't hesitate to also mention that uh, we have another generation of McConkies now who've done our program with your daughter, uh, having uh, one of your daughters having uh, done our high school program uh, first, right? Uh, could you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, so she uh, was very interested in the idea of economics and so when, when you had brought up uh, you know, the high school program and you had merged uh, with the organization to be able to do that, you know, I, I you know, said, hey, this is a week, you get to fly to Boston and, uh, and do this uh, program. And she was you know, obviously very interested in the idea of being trusted enough to be able to go and fly on her own out to you know, the East Coast and went and did that program. And in fact, it was because of those uh, that she did two of those, and because of those programs in economics, she actually uh, went to uh, and decided to get a degree in economics and data analytics from Purdue. And uh, she's actually graduating this spring um, uh, with that degree. Uh, has a job with a, a major Fortune 20 company. Uh, it's going to be starting off doing cybersecurity for them. So uh, it's been very uh, fascinating to be able to watch her uh, take kind of uh, a little bit after her parents in, in this regard and grow and then also make it her own. Well, that's wonderful. I bet she loved Purdue. I know there is our, our, some of the people listening may not know, but their president, Mitch Daniels, who's just been outstanding, is a former member of our board of trustees and a good friend of our organization. So I, I'm sure she had a good experience there. Well, Mitch Daniels has run that school in a manner that we, we wish all uh, universities across the country would be run. Not only has he uh, really stood firm on behalf of free speech when so many universities have caved to uh, the ideas that we need to limit speech because some people might be offended by it, uh, he's taken the completely opposite tact. And in fact, you know, he's been president now, I believe, for 11 years. And that when he first came in, the in state tuition at Purdue was $9,992. 11 years later, the in-state tuition is $9,992. He has kept it flat with, with inflation, I think has led to like a functionally a 30% reduction uh, in the real cost uh, for students of Indiana who are going to that school. And so he's just been a fantastic leader, standing up for what's right, doing what the students want. They have record-breaking enrollment. And uh, you know she got the president's scholarship uh, so, so very proud of her and everything that she's been able to do and of, uh, and, and of going to a school that's been led in such a, uh, such a great way. Well, we, we share your sense of pride in her since she is a TFAS alum now, and we'll, we'll be looking forward to following her career. Uh, you know, Dan, last fall, our board uh, did a strategic plan, a new strategic plan for our organization. And it was an interesting process. The trustees reviewed our vision for the organization, our mission statement. And we only made one minor change to that mission statement that's been the same one we've had since we were founded in 1967. And as you know, it's a mission to develop leaders. And what we did is we added the word courageous to it, to develop courageous leaders. Because we thought that today, more so than in the past even, it really takes courage to be a leader who wants to stand up and speak out for American values, for limited government, the rule of law, uh, our free enterprise system. And in so many ways, you've demonstrated courage. And I think we've seen that today. Uh, it was courage not to throw that brochure away and to say, well, maybe I'll apply for that scholarship. Certainly it took courage in uh, 1995 to get on a plane and fly to Prague and attend that program. And of course, courage, uh, this ADAPT, and uh, overcome attitude you had after your accident in 2007, and then to be uh, a leader now in the, the legislature 
uh, has to be courageous. So we admire all that you're doing in that regard. You know, you're someone we're very proud of who's, who's taken what he learned at our programs and elsewhere in life and really turned it into working uh, to help make sure that all Americans have the opportunity for human flourishing. So we want to thank you for what you do. Before we end, I always like to wrap up these conversations with a question, and that is if, if you could give a piece of leadership advice to our students, you know, as I know you've done with your own daughters, but what would that advice be that you could share uh, in terms of becoming honorable leaders and courageous leaders? Yeah, so one of the things I would say is that you, you really do have to know yourself, right, and know what it is that you stand for and believe in. And that takes some work uh, to do. You need to uh, study the issues. You need to go out there and talk with people. You need to be willing to embrace uh, conversation with those people on the other side uh, of you and hear their perspectives and be willing to set aside your own viewpoints, be willing to be proved wrong, right, uh, with that. And if, you're, if you are willing and able to do that, what you will find at the end of the day is that uh, you know, one of the things I've said about myself is I would rather be right than win. And what I meant by that is I would rather change my perspective on something and have the right perspective, be proven wrong and change my mind and be on the right side of something than to run like a bulldog kind of through, you know, uh, or, you know, a donkey or, you know, you know, whatever, kind of, you know, just keep pounding until you win, right? And that, you know, so it, it, if you are willing to do that at the end of the day, you'll be respected by your uh, peers, by your friends and foes alike. Uh, you'll be respected by those people that you, you are standing up for. Um, it, it is sometimes a lonely path, right, to be willing to do that. Uh, you'll take a lot of criticism and such, but at the end of the day, uh, pursue what's right and just. And it, if you pursue that, even if it means, you know what, you lose an election, right? Or you lose, you know, uh, that job opportunity, right? But, you know, at the end of the day, you have to live with yourself. And if you do what's right, um, I believe, and, you know, part of it's based on my faith that if I do what's right, and and uh, that means that it a door closes as a result of doing that, and another door will open up, and uh, another opportunity will come along. So, I uh, that 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 is that's that's the way I, I, which I structure my life, and encourage others to do the same. Uh, that's superb. Uh, very early on, someone gave me some advice, or uh, gave me an observation about politics, which I've always thought of when I look at your career, and that is that we, a politician has to always remember that. Winning is the means to an end. It's not the end in and of itself. Uh, the goal isn't to win the office and then, you know, you've, you've accomplished your mission. You're, you're running for office. You're hoping you win for a purpose to accomplish something. And uh, I've appreciated that focus you've always had as someone serving in office. So thank you for your service, not only uh, as a member of a political office, but your service in the Army National Guard as well. It's very uh, relevant uh, this Memorial Day. And uh, so thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. I know you're a very busy man. And uh, I think this has been very enlightening and uh, interesting conversation. So uh, I wish you the very best, Dan, and look forward to your continued uh, involvement with the Fund for American Studies. Oh, glad to do it. Anytime I can be of service, you know, please don't hesitate to let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Liberty and Leadership Podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe, download, like, and share the show on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you like the episode, I ask you to rate it and review it. If you have a comment or question for the show, please drop us an email at podcast at tfas. Dot org. That's podcast at tfas.org. The Liberty and Leadership Podcast is produced at K Global Studios in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Roger Ream, and until next time, be a leader for liberty. <laughs>